We started to brainstorm as always together with Daniel and Peach and Philip and Christina about the theme no, of, of EAT. Um, and Philip actually came up with this Bergsonian idea of matter and memory, uh, reference to Bergson's book of 1896. We always kind of thought it's an incredible, incredibly useful broader umbrella for many other questions that we can interpret in relation to Bergson from body-spirit relation to sustainability to memory in time, all topics you saw in the talks this, uh, this morning. And of course, the idea also um, that things are moving, as Philip said at the beginning of the day, it isn't a fixed definition that it's all about being together in mutual relation makes uh, Bergson so relevant uh, for now. What is also super interesting is the impact Bergson had on post-colonial thinkers. We had an invitation, actually a conversation um, with uh, Bachia Diagna, Suleiman Bachia Diagna, the great Senegalese philosopher, which you can see online um, on the EAT channel. Uh, and his book, Post-Colonial Bergson, where he talks about the influence, actually, of Bergson on two 20th century intellectuals, on the Senegalese poet and politician, Leopold Seda Senghor, and on Muhammad Iqbal, the uh, Indian Muslim scholar, and also politician, and to which extent actually Bergson was really a toolbox for them in their post-colonial struggle. Um, so yeah, Bergson as a challenge to the traditional ideals and values and logic of Western philosophy is interesting. And as mentioned in relation to Armin's archive, the Elan Vital, the idea of a kind of a continuously emerging cosmology, um, the idea of living organism, of always being in the process of becoming, makes it, of course, super relevant for so many practitioners in art today. And that brings us directly to Pamela Rosenkrantz, uh, whom I'm now going to introduce, because, of course, Pamela, for many, many years, has worked with exhibitions uh, as living organisms, most recently in a show in Bregenz, which transformed the Zumtor building in a kind of a living organism, we can say. Pamela is an artist working near Zurich. Uh, her work transcends materiality through explorations, actually, of the particularities composing our world, abstracting biological and also cultural impacts on human experience. As our friend Shumon Bazar wrote, um, Pamela brings many worlds together, no? deep research from philosophy, pharmaceuticals, biology, and the industrial forces that operate simultaneously at the scale of our cells and of our planets. In the recent exhibition, in a very Bergsonian exhibition in Bregenz, this living organism, there were many amazing questions raised, like how porous are we? How do we absorb? What is light? What is color? How are sense born? And how um, do they behave in relation to the receptors? Um, and we hear more about that from Pamela now in a talk. We are incredibly excited to then, in a second part, have uh, David Aleman with us, the co-founder of ON. Uh, we're going to talk with David and Pamela about their collaboration, uh, which is very much um, still at the beginning. They started to collaborate last year, and we're going to hear more about Pamela and ON are going to do together in the future. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Pamela Rosenkranz. <clears throat> Thank you so much, hans -Ulrich. and um, I'm so happy to, to be here, to be invited, and um, I hope my voice will follow through with us. We had uh, many interesting discussions already yesterday. It is a bit obstructed now, so um, let's hope um, we will... Um, be able to finish all the interesting questions when we talk afterwards. And um, let me just find a way how to do this here. Oops. So I'm uh, gonna dive into a text and um, read it to you. And so um, without much information, we jump right into it. When light from the sun reaches 
the Earth's atmosphere, longer wavelengths, the warmer lights of red, orange, and yellow pass through, while the shorter rays of the color blue get absorbed by gas molecules and dispersed across the skies, these blue rays color the skies above and reflect the oceans beneath them. And this is how blue built the stage to play the leading color in the evolution of our eye. Our earliest ancestor species were to develop photosensitivity were aquatic, actually shark-like creatures. Only two specific wavelength ranges of electromagnetic radiation, blue and some green visible light can travel through water. So when life began to perceive light and with that the difference between depth and height, the visual sense for space attracted certain species to, the, to these lights of the heavens, creating the, the drive to travel up to the surface and take land with their newly growing paths. We seem to know this story implicitly, but we tend to forget that our vision, like our other sense organs, is not abstract, but very much influenced and shaped by the natural conditions of the relatively much longer period of the preceding species underwater. In fact, we still perceive much more of the color blue than any other color. Today, the deep ocean is still mostly unexplored, as are many species to be discovered within the Amazon rainforest, but also the very insights of our own bodies are only beginning to be understood. Apparently, the barely known ecosystem within us makes up for roughly one kilogram of our body weight. And quite contrary to the history of human knowledge, this regime of microbiotic organisms precedes humankind by far. Some research even suggests viruses predate cell-based life on this planet. Best known and feared are viruses such as obviously the novel coronavirus we have our situation with right now, or then Ebola, HIV or Zika, <clears throat> bacteria like Salmonella and parasites like rabies. In spite of their high profile, such microbes are the exceptions within our lives. The vast bulk even if they're pathogenic, are no danger to our immune system. In fact, many have a very positive effect and help us by training our immune systems. The term microbiome was coined in the 90s, but research is still in the beginning phase of sorting out the good from the bad and the many more between. As this community of organisms is so manifold and complex, one speaks about a universe to be discovered within us how it operates, interacts amongst itself and changes our life is still left to be explored. The main idea so far is the more diversity, not just in the environment we live in, but also the environment that lives within us, the better. As we are learning now, the gut is fundamentally intertwined with our brain. It influences our psychological sanity. Current research points to how certain bacterial cultures cause anxiety, depression, or even Alzheimer's disease, while others might be able to help protect from neurodegeneration again. But the impact on our state of mind seems to be even more shockingly direct if we take a very common parasite as an example. Toxoplasmosis, a neuroactive parasite that seems to influence one of our most existential feelings, sexual attraction. We tend to see sexuality as one of the main markers of our individuality, but not only does our own biological system react to sexu sexual attractions in ways that we can't control, there are also parasites that can neurologically influence or possibly even direct our behavior. Apparently, People infected by toxoplasmosis are more prone to be involved in car accidents and female carriers are known to acquire more designer clothing. <laughs> Overall, about 30% of the global populations are carrier, quite a target group. The idea that we can be influenced from within and at the same time harness this fact to influence the behavior of the world around us 
is a provocative and difficult topic. It challenges a fundamental understanding of who we are. Are we them or are they us? We humans, alongside mice and other mammals, are only intermediary hosts for toxoplasmosis. Cats are its main target. In this unconscious menage a trois, the parasite needs the mouse to be attracted to the cat, so it travels up to the region of the mouse's brain where sexual arousal occurs. And there, it lets that the mouse <coughs> get dizzy and leads it to approach its predator instead of fleeing, so that the cat can much more easily catch and ingest it. Once inside that cat, the parasite has reached its goal. It can, pro um, re it can reproduce. Humans are part of its scheme in more abstract ways now, that we're not haunted by predator cats anymore. Those who carry it are apparently more attracted to scents that originate from cat pheromones. And this scent can today be found in many fragrances. One of them, probably the most famous, is Chanel No. 5. Even more interesting, the synthetic version also works when transferred back to nature. In an experiment, a Bronx Zoo researcher tried a variety of scents and discovered that jaguars by far preferred Calvin Klein's obsession for men. <laughs> this scent is including the mighty molecules in question and coincidentally in a composition that is so close to the original pheromones of the wildcats, or at least it seems so, that the perfume is now further successfully used to lure the very shy Amazonian jaguars to photo traps. just to tell you what not to wear when you're actually going to the Amazon rainforest. A capital A, crossed by a river, Amazon, was the original logo for the retail business Amazon, now transformed into an arrow reaching from A to Z. A vision of the commercial Organism selling a diversity and multiplicity as great as the ecosystem of the Amazon itself. A digital macrobion. Now, the Amazon River, which branches through the world's largest reservoir of natural resources, symbolizes human dominance over nature. Driven by the vision of to total market dominance, Jeff Bezos exhausted the fundamental tension of the homonym, the eternal conflict between man and biology. While Amazon's ecological survival rate has been drastically re reduced over, over the last decades, Amazon.com Inc. has spectacularly succeeded in permeating every dimension of life. It's very competitive advantage coming from the vastness and abundance of products and services on offer. Terra Preta is a black, earth-like, anthropogenic soil which enhanced fertility with, with enhanced fertility due to the high levels of organic matter. It is based on the fermentation of human waste enhanced by warm composting. The application of plant-based charcoal and a long timeline ensures it is converted into a pathogen-free, safe humus that retains its nutrients. Compared to conventional composting methods, terra preta doesn't decompose nutrients, but regenerates them. A self-feeding system that remains fertile for incredibly long periods of time by a self-perpetuating high microbial activity. And this prehistoric fertilizer that allegedly dates back to more than 7,000 years and was found in the Brazilian Amazonas basin is said to be the fundament and proof of a very much larger and dense prehistoric civilization of several million people that have lived in the Amazon region. Amazon.com Inc.'s corporate evolution has recently peaked in the introduction of a voice-activated AI-fueled personal assistant named Alexa. When the device becomes deeply rooted within the context in which it resides, it can figure out what we need before we even need it by observing our patterns of behavior. In my work on Amazon, 
into the land. Here at the Louisiana Museum in Denmark, she guides us on a daily journey through the diversity of the myriads of products from Amazon.com, recounting them alphabetically, starting at the beginning with Alaya, the princess of R&B, when she's woken up every morning. And now I take you up in a probably dizzying fast array of images up the stairs through the Kunsthaus Bregenz through my show House of Meme from April last year to conclude. How permeable are we and how absorbent? What are the colors and light? What are color and light? How do smells occur and how do the receptors sensitive to them behave? How are sound and vibration registered? And isn't the building similarly to a living being also able to collect and preserve such experiences as fluctuations in temperature, degrees of humidity and vibrations? Plastic sheeting shimmers, sound vibrates, humidity swirls and an archaic smell of a burning house that is completely synthetically created pervades the spaces. The top floor is home to healer. It is a computer-controlled machine that reacts to electromagnetic radiation, moving, raising its head and observing its surroundings, or biding its time motionlessly on the floor, just like a snake does. Reflective scales conceal its network of sensors and semiconductors, while inaudible sound of electronic noise recharges it. What do we see when we encounter a robot snake? Danger, beauty or, or algorithms? The house becomes an animated habitat for this robotic creature that is animated by our own devices. Signals from our cell phones are already being fed into it even as we first encounter it. The building becomes an organism of expanded biological interactivity. As I believe in the vital energy of the entanglement with the biological world, I started to work with these animals that we humans share such a deep-rooted relationship with. Its first iteration was born from the sands and living in the courtyard of Beit el Serkal in Sharsha. Um, each iteration um, carries a skin that um, shows its... Um, its origin. It's made from a kirigami cut structure that surrounds the body. The snake, as one of the most ancient symbols, incorporates a time scale which is punctuated by various large scale extinction events that it has survived. But due to its excep exceptional ability to survive, the snake can also be interpreted as a symbol of the future, pointing to a time beyond human existence. The first written documents already tell of the deep-rooted connection we share with this animal. The snake was worshipped in the Sumerian cultures as Ningishtida. Tiamat in Babylon was considered the essence of the origin of the world as such, and the more commonly known Uroboros was the ancient Egyptian symbol of the beginning and the end of time. Its cultural heritage translated into the nowadays widely known and used road of Asclepius that we all know as a signal of medical agencies. And today, the snake's fatal weapon, its venom, has been reappropriated into a life force. It consists of hundreds of different types of peptides, enzymes and toxins, which have been the basis to synthesize powerful medications. Its main adaptation in blood thinners 
and therefore treatment for one of the biggest health threats humans face today. The snake's body structure further provides modern technology with bionic tools. Snake-shaped nanorobots um, penetrate blood vessels, insert stents or close internal wounds. Larger robot snakes master amphibious tasks and are used for rescue or cleanups after or during disasters, like for example in Fukushima. So here we see healer um, waters from, uh, shown in Okayama at the art summit that Pierre Week was curating in 2019. Healer is moving in a side-winding side motion. This dazzling and inhuman form of movement stimulates evolutionary deep-rooted feelings of fear and awe in us. I like to work with such primordial or probably you could say raw feelings as I think they link us with the awareness to what it means to be human beyond our culturally obstructed ideas of identity. I wanted to create an opportunity to meet with an extraordinary and contemporary creature, a robotic entity that simulates life and lets us imagine the future as well as confronting with the embodiment of this symbol as ancient as symbols itself. And maybe this is um, what I would like to add to the topic. To me, as an artist, matter is memory and memory is matter. I try to look at things as complex and hardly separable. So I think when we look at art, we have an opportunity to learn about our perception of reality as a physical process. As I started with our deep entanglement with nature in seeing blue, I would like to look at seeing as a physical process. And in this sense, I like to look at thinking or a, as a physical process too. In order to think and fuel new connections, the brain needs sugar to burn. These new connections are building new reality. And in this sense of a raised awareness about movement and connectedness with nature, I would like to open for David Alleman, who provides us with the tools we need to run up the mountains and dive into that blue afterwards on the on walk we are going to take. 